So now I'd like to look at the physical properties of soil and what they mean for the interaction of plants with this substrate in which they grow. We'll look at each of these things in turn. First there's soil texture. Basically soil is a mixture of a bunch of particles and that are categorized into three different categories, sand, silt, and clay. Sand particles are the largest, silt, intermediate, and clay particles, the finest. Soil types are named based on the relative proportions of these things. If a sand predominates with very little silt and clay, it's called a sandy soil. If there's a little more um, silt and a tiny bit more clay, it's loamy sand. A loam is that which is an approximately, I used to think it was approximately equal mixture. Actually, that's a clay loam according to this graph. But at the other end is clay at the bottom, and you can see even a clay soil has a large proportion of clay particles, but still a large amount of the other two particles as well. Clay particles being very fine, there are many, many more of them, and they can really affect the water holding capacity of the soil. Here are the types of soil in a three-dimensional graph with each point of this triangle is either sand, silt, or clay a hundred percent. So you can see that clay soils can have small proportions of the others in this top part. Silt, the intermediate size to the right, and sand, the biggest particles to the left. But wherever the proportions are oops, in these, at these um, different places determines what kind of soil it is. How well soil holds water depends on the size of particles in that soil because clay particles are so small and they have a very high surface area relative to sand it can um, really develop a strong negative charge and also holds a lot of water and holds on to the water well. So a clay soil, when wetted, stays wet longer than a sandier soil. So too much clay, too many small particles in the soil can actually make a barrier to drainage. And when you get muck or other conditions like that in wetlands, this can be a barrier to drainage and lead to anaerobic conditions. Sand, which we see a lot of when we go to the beach, can hold water, as you know if you ever have made a sand castle or a sand sculpture, but water drains out of sand very easily and the soil dries quickly. If a plant is adapted to this, it's good, but it can be hard on certain plants. So the mixture of soil particles determines how well the soil holds water and how easily water passes through it or percolates through it. Soil particles are organized into aggregates, larger units, and the nature of the aggregation is called the soil structure. So <clears throat> soil scientists refer to porosity of soil and organic matter. So the types of soil best for plant growth are those that let both water and air move through them. Although you can find certain plants adapted for almost any kinds of soil. Soil pH is important because it affects how soil particles hold on to and let go of nutrients. The available nutrients to a plant are not the same as the total nutrients in the soil because at certain pHs, the farther away from neutral, usually nutrients are harder to obtain. 
Certain nutrients, however, phosphorus for one, is more available at higher pH, more basic conditions. So humus is organic material that's broken down into very fine particles, not to be confused with hummus made of squashed up chickpeas. And humus is a, a source of nutrients for plants. Some humus is easily broken down. Some is very recalcitrant or you know resistant to breaking down and these are plants that are more woody in general give rise to this slower breaking down organic matter. So some humus can be thousands of years old and still not completely broken down. Different parts of the world have soils with different cation exchange capacities. What this means is that soil solution ions are in equilibrium with those adsorbed onto the roots of plants for bringing into plants. And as plants suck up those ions or remove them from the soil, the solution in the soil is at a lower concentration. And so the exchange sites, the particles of soil or the rocks around there, release more nutrients into soil. The more acidic the soil, the greater the cation exchange. And what can happen in very rainy, humid places, the soil becomes more and more acidic and the nutrients just quickly go through unless they are captured by the plants into their own biomass. In this figure, you can see that there are, here are three different types of soils from left to right, more acidic, lower pH, to more neutral. Um, on the left, the one more acidic is clay loam. If we add lime, which is a very basic lime rock, crushed lime rock, basic substance, you can see that bases increase and pH gets lower. And sandy loam with a higher pH in general has fewer hydrogen ions. So this shows the percent base saturation and cation exchange capacity for three soil types. And cation exchange capacity is expressed in centimoles of positive charge per kilo of dry soil. So how does water move in the soil? After a night, as dawn is just coming, soil is said to be at field capacity, where its water is in more or less in equilibrium with the air right above it. Then water moves up, up into a plant by capillary action, because xylem tubes are very fine and water molecules mo move up that way and then are pulled through the plant by transpiration. There is a point after which all the water is taken from the soil that's called the wilting point when a plant can't take any more water out. If it gets too dry, the plant wilts permanently and can't recover. That's the permanent wilting point of the soil. So it's of interest to know the wilting coefficient You'll remember from ecology that the water cycle is solar powered with water being taken up by plants, <clears throat> going through the plant body, and then transpiration, taking water vapor out into the atmosphere. Water evaporates from the surface of the earth as well. And from bodies of water, 
till eventually it gathers and when things are humid enough, precipitation brings water back to earth. I like this figure from our book because it shows a picture of soil particles at the top. At the left, fully saturated with water between everyone. In the middle, field capacity with water and air between all of them. And then the wilting point where there's nothing but air left. And the bars can show at the bottom in a different way. Saturated soil is made up of solids and water. Field capacity has water and air and solids. The wilting point has a tiny bit of water and the hygroscopic coefficient or the permanent wilting point has a little bit less. And this cactus to the right reminds us that some plants are tougher than others. If the soil runs out of water, they just stop pulling it up. This graph shows us that the permanent wilting point of soils differ with respect to the um, relative amounts of particles of different sizes. So the permanent wilting point of a clay soil is much is at a much higher percent of soil water than a sandy soil. Now, I'm just wondering to myself, is this because of the plants that live there, or is this just entirely a physical thing? That's a question I have to think about. So dissolved in water are the nutrients plants need for life, macronutrients needed in larger quantities, and micronutrients needed only in trace amounts. They're abbreviated here by their chemical symbol, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, potassium, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, and sulfur. <clears throat> the micronutrients, I think you can figure those out. And for some plants, also, sodium is required, cobalt and silicon. Probably the most important nutrient for all plants is nitrogen. And plants can absorb nitrogen in the form of nitrate through their roots. Atmospheric nitrogen is useless to all except the nitrogen-fixing bacteria and plants. Plants fix nitrogen with the help of prokaryotic partners. And in legumes, for example, rhizobium bacteria species live in root nodules. And other plants, non-legumes, have franchia. Here's a photo of root nodules on a soybean. And here's a cross-section and close-up into some cells of that, that in the root nodule. The one on the left is infected with rhizobium bacteria. The cell on the right doesn't have any. Phosphorus is probably the next most important. The three big ones are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Phosphorus helps with nitrogen fixation, and in the southeastern U.S., in general, phosphorus is low and therefore the limiting nutrient. Forests of the Pacific Northwest have the, probably the most phosphorus, and phosphorus is the one mineral you probably remember from ecology that doesn't have gaseous forms. It's maybe circulating as a dust. It can be bound to clay or complexed with cations. It leaches relatively slowly compared with nitrogen. Some plants have special morphological adaptations for low phosphorus environments, such as the cluster roots, also known as proteoid roots, seen in Banksia, a, spe a genus in the Proteaceae. This is why they're called proteoid roots. But these cluster roots don't only occur in the Proteaceae. They are just dense clusters of fine lateral rootlets, ones that come out to the side. And these roots produce organic acids that make phosphorus 
more available for the plant. So even some legumes have these proteoid roots. Here we see some in lupinus. Plants are often helped out by mycorrhizae, both endomycorrhizae and ectomycorrhizae. These are orchid um, fungi that live either inside roots or around roots and help plants reap nutrients from the soil. Ectomycorrhizae sort of effectively expand the root system. And interestingly, they may connect unrelated plants and allow unrelated plants to exchange nutrients under the ground. Endomycorrhizae that are inside root cells are sometimes called vesicular arbuscular mycorrhizae, VAM. And that's because the points of transfer are uh, called arbuscles. So this is a beautiful photo, I think, of root tips surrounded by a sheath of hyphae of mycorrhizae. And you can see how these hyphae are connecting these two different roots, allowing exchange between them.